like to um, adjourn the Board of Education closed session and um, reconvene the Board of Education open session at 7.01. Um, our meeting, um, I am obviously not Ed Gilliland. I am Rob Hammond. Ed is excused this evening. Um, our Pledge of Allegiance this evening will be done by Plymouth Elementary School and the principal from Plymouth is here to make some introductions. Good evening, board members, and good evening, district cabinet members, parents, and esteemed guests. My name is Dr. Greg Giroux, and it is truly an honor to serve as the principal of Plymouth Elementary School. And we have many exciting things happening at our school. And tonight, a group of our remarkable fifth grade students who serve on our Renaissance leadership team. First, they will lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance, and then they're going to share some great news about what's happening in our school library. So it's my pleasure to introduce Genesis Canovayas, come on up. Esmeralda Roman. Tanya Rosales Zamora. And Michaela Ortega. Please stand. Gentlemen, remove your hats. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible for liberty and justice for all. Good evening, my name is Genesis Canovayas and my fellow teammates are Esmeralda Roman, Antonio Rosales, and Michaela Ortega. We are fifth graders at Plymouth Elementary and we are so excited to tell you about the amazing transformation of our school library. Plymouth students love to read and we have always enjoyed visiting our library too, find great stories to read and books to learn about our favorite topics, but our library was in desperate need of a makeover. We needed new books, better organization, and a funner, brighter space. A little over a year ago, something started to change at Plymouth Library. Volunteers began visiting and working in our library to make it better. Ms. Harba, who is our current librarian, and Ms. Sandy Gray, a retired librarian from Monrovia, led a team of volunteers who d donated hundreds of, of their time to clean up, organize, and beautify our, our library. The results were amazing. B books were organized and labeled by theme, and it was easy for students to find a book about anything they might be interested in. Soon we realized that our library needed more. Yeah, it was neat, organized, and clean, but we wanted a library that was more inspiring and fun. Miss Harba led the way. She had a vision of what our library could be and the passion to make it happen. We found pictures of amazing libraries across the country, and many of them were painted with vivid and joyful colors. Many of the libraries we saw also had inspiring and beautiful artwork on the walls. And just about all the libraries we looked at had cozy and comfortable places for kids to sit. But how can we make this dream a reality? The Scholar Dollars Grant was a way to make it happen, but how could it, it couldn't be easy. We would have to compete against over 100 schools to earn $10,000. The school with the most votes over a two-week period would win the grant. Our PTA led the charge, and the whole school community came together to try to earn this amazing $10,000 grant. Students, staff, and parents told their friends and family. Thousands of people voted for Plymouth. 
to win the grant, but the competition was very close. At the end of the two weeks, we crossed our fingers and hoped that we would have enough votes to win the grant. To win the grant. And the results were... We won! Thanks to the incredible support of thousands of people who voted for Plymouth, we won the $10,000 grant. When the money came in, it was time to get to work. Charlie, the painter, Mrs. Harbaugh, and volunteers worked tirelessly to create a masterpiece of color. Mrs. Harbaugh found some super singing for students, colorful, comfy, and fun. And we found an inspiring piece of artwork that would make the perfect addition to our colorful walls. The grant made our library makeover possible. There is color on all of our walls. We have new library Chromebooks, colorful new library carts, colorful new benches, and colorful accents all over. Our, vet, our, oh, our library went through an amazing transformation, and it's now the most popular place in the entire Plymouth campus. Students can't wait to visit the library and are more even inspired to read. We are, so, we are so excited about our updated library. Thanks to our awesome students, great parents, and volunteers. Plymouth PTA, Plymouth staff, our district staff, and Dr. Tarosian for supporting our Plymouth Library transformation. But you certainly have a lot to be proud of. That, that was a huge community effort. I, um, Desiree uh, worked tirelessly to make sure that everybody on this body was voting daily to make sure that those votes got counted. And I'm really happy that it bore the fruit that it did. And your school looks beautiful. You guys are awesome. And thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, let's see. Up next, we have our employees of the month. And... Dr. Kaiser is going to be presenting. Gives me great pleasure. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I totally went out of order. I'm sorry. Up first, 
it, you, did, you were doing a great job there, Sue. <laughs> um, <laughs> before we get to the Employees of the Month, we get to honor a person who was um, nominated on being the Educator of the Year by the California League of Schools. And who is presenting? And, yeah, let's see. We're going to work our way up the agenda instead of down the agenda. Okay, so I just want to get all that clear. Now that I've cleared all that up, we're going to go. Um, now is the order of business. Um, <laughs> uh, may I entertain a motion for the approval of the minutes? So moved. Motion. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? Um, maybe please have a vote. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Vice President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. All right. Now, the part that I was trying to get to so quickly. Uh, the Board of Education would like to congratulate MSH, MHS math teacher uh, Philip Hang on being named the Educator of the Year by the California League of Schools. And Dr. Kaiser, will you please make the presentation? Gladly. Good evening, Board Vice President Hammond, Board and Cabinet and community members. It gives me great, great pleasure tonight to present to you Mr. Phil Hang. Phil, would you please join me at the podium? And Phil, I'd like your administrators, Phil and Kirk, to come join us also. Um, Phil is the chair of the Monrovia High School math department, and he does a fantastic job leading his, his crew, but not only leading his crew, teaching his children every single day, and looking at his kids as those kids that need to have that mathematical knowledge imparted to them for, the, for their future success and understanding the importance and the weight of that. Phil was selected by his administrators, and that's why I've asked them to come and stand with him here um, as being an exemplary teacher at the high school. And so he was nominated as the Educator of the Year from his high school to go to the California League of Schools regional competition. And he went there and delivered a speech that had everybody so inspired. It was a complete evening of speeches, and I'm telling you that it was by far one of the best speeches I've ever heard about why he's an educator, and the heart that came forward from this man was truly touching. And so with that award, he was named the Educator of the Year for Region 8, which encompasses the area of San Luis Obispo all the way through Los Angeles Unified and all the way out here across the 210 corridor. Wow. So that's very that's many districts. <laughs> the, the penalty for being named the Educator of the Year um, took Phil to Monterey. That's a pretty good penalty, isn't it? <laughs> and so in Monterey, he was in Monterey competing with seven other educators from all over the state. And I have to tell you that I, I watched carefully how they were rating these candidates because you know my favorite candidate is Mr. Phil Hang. And I have to tell you, he came in second in the state. Wow. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> And so, Phil, on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to present you with a certificate that says the Board of Education, Monrovia Unified School District Board of Education, wishes, wishes to congratulate Philip Hang, Monrovia High School, on being named Educator of the Year by the California League of Schools. Congratulations. Those are very kind words. Thank <laughs> you. 
We have a number of great teachers in this district, and Mr. Hang is an example of, of one. Um, congratulations to you um, and all your efforts and what you do for every one of the students in our district to make their educational experience the best it can be. Thanks very much. Before our meeting, uh, the board was in closed session, and during that closed session, we took no reportable action. Um, up next, we have the Board of Education and the Chamber of Commerce, uh, too, would like to congratulate, congratulate our employees of the month, and Dr. Kaiser will do the introductions again. Board Vice President Hammond, Board, Dr. Trosian, tonight we honor our classified and certificated employees of the month. These individuals have been selected by their staff for their ongoing dedication to our community, parents, and most importantly, our students that we serve. This evening, they will receive tokens of appreciation from the Board of Education, the Chamber of Commerce, and the Federal Foothill Federal Credit Union for their ongoing contributions. I'd like to welcome the Mayflower Principal, Michelle Costarella, to the podium to recognize her staff members. Good evening, members of the board, and good evening, Dr. Trosian. I am so honored to be here tonight to introduce Mayflower's certificate, or Certificated Employee of the Month, Ms. Jennifer Dana. <laughs> Ms. Dana has been an outstanding teacher at Mayflower since 1996. Over the past 22 years, she has diligently served our school community in a multitude of ways and been an inspiration to our students and colleagues. Jenny, as she is lovingly called by friends, has spent her entire teaching career at Mayflower, teaching second grade and third grade. She has supported our school by serving on various committees, including several leadership teams, school site council, curriculum advisory, and student study team. Additionally, Jenny served as an MTA representative for many years. Outside of the school, she is an involved community member. She is a past member of the Covina Arts Commission, and she and her husband, Bob, devote much of their time to animal rescue. They foster several rescue dogs and are members of the Turtle Conservation Group and have rescued over 20 turtles and tortoises. Additionally, she participates yearly in the St. Baldrick's fundraiser which is near and dear to her heart and raises money for pediatric cancer research. Jenny is a light in everyone's day. And I say this personally because I've worked with her for 23 years, 22 years. Um, Jenny is very loved by her students and family and her families and colleagues alike. Staff members admire her for her positivity, her commitment to her students, and her professional demeanor. Her students adore her because she is kind-hearted and smart, and according to her current second grade class, some of the greatest things about her are that she is artistic and thoughtful, she is always nice, and introduces fun things like art and caterpillars. 
Her incredible impact on students is apparent as current fifth grade students and even students that she once had who are now in college remember her as a standout teacher, one who was always gentle, always loving, patient, and fun. Jenny came to teaching as a second career after working in the art business. As a director of an art gallery, she had many opportunities to work with students who toured the gallery, and she soon found that she had a love of working with children and changed her career. And we are the lucky ones for it. Jenny shared with me that the most important part of her job is loving the kids no matter what. When they leave, she said, I want them to know that they were loved. Ms. Dana has dedicated her entire teaching career to the Mayflower community. We thank her and we commend her for going above and beyond in her service to Mayflower. <laughs> Jenny, on behalf of the Monrovia Unified School District and the Chamber of Commerce, I congratulate you on your award. You want to hold this out for the picture. You don't want to hold that in the picture. I'd like to welcome Dr. Greg Giraud to the podium to introduce his Employees of the Month. Good evening again, uh, board members and district cabinet and esteemed guests. It's my honor to announce Plymouth Certificated Employee of the Month, Ms. Sheena Rayholm. Sheena is here with are you, are they both here? Yeah, with her wonderful parents, Terry and Tammy Rayholm. Miss Rayholm might be a little uncomfortable with the attention with the attention, but she is so deserving of this honor. She is truly an exceptional teacher. She is a Coatsen Fellow, an honor given to teachers who dedicate two years of intense professional growth and learning. On top of that, Sheena plays crucial roles on our instructional leadership team our behavior support team, our bullying, and our bullying prevention team. She is an exemplary teacher, a leader, and an inspiration. I interviewed Sheena to prepare for the speech, and I think I understand why she's become such an amazing teacher. She's been working at elementary schools her entire life. Sheena's from Wrightwood, a small town in the San Bernardino Mountains, which also happens to be located next to the ski resort Mountain High. I asked her how it must have been to grow up with skiing as your playground, and she admitted that the first time she visited the place was as a 22-year-old, and she still hasn't picked up skiing. <laughs> so it turns out that when the local kids went to ski, Sheena was busy learning about teaching. When her classmates took the ski class after school, Sheena stayed behind, and instead enrolling in a course on sign language a class that she says helped change the course of her life. When her first grade teacher asked her to draw, asked the students to draw themselves as grown-ups, Sheena drew a teacher, and she has never wanted to be anything else. 
except maybe a white water rafting guide in the summers. <laughs> Her mom was a school secretary, and even as a young child, Sheena would help after school. And by age 14, she had her first official school job as a student worker. And she continued to serve the schools in her hometown as a classroom aide, a substitute teacher, and as a teacher. She, she eventually felt the need to expand her horizons beyond her hometown, so she applied for teaching positions across Southern California. And when she was called for an interview for a position in a place called Monrovia, she had no idea where that was. As she made the 90 minute or so drive, she thought to herself, where did I apply to? So we are so glad that she found Monrovia. And although she moved to a bigger city, Sheena brought with her the heart and soul of the small town where she grew up. Quite literally, her mom and dad make the drive from Wrightwood every Thursday, or Wednesday I guess, to volunteer in Sheena's classroom. They have had a huge impact on the classroom and have become an important part of the Plymouth community. Most people who work with Ms. Rayholm have no idea that she had quite an illustrious career as a marching band musician. She's marched in the London New Year's Day Parade, the Hollywood Christmas Parade, the Macy's Day Parade, and even the Rose Bowl twice. And she's also played in music videos and movies. I asked our Plymouth staff to share some of their thoughts about Ms. Rayholm, and I'll read some of the things that they said. Sheena is a dedicated professional and is always willing to lend a helping hand to anyone who needs it. Sheena always has a great attitude. She's so respectful to everyone around her, including her students. She goes the extra mile for them constantly. Just seeing her in the hallways will brighten your day, and she can always make you feel special. Sheena goes above and beyond to make learning fun, engaging, and memorable for her students. She builds lasting relationships with her students, which is evident when past students gather around her daily before and after school for hugs. Sheena generously enriches the Plymouth community. She's one of my most favorite people on our staff. I hope Ms. Rayholm feels recognized, and I also know how important it is that we draw inspiration from the example that she sets. Sheena, you inspire me. It would be understandable if Ms. Rayholm took some credit for all the success, but she maintains an incredible sense of humility and service. She told me, I'm the lucky one. It's a huge privilege. These parents allow me to work with their children. Perhaps as part of her small town values, but I cannot imagine anyone more deserving of this honor. Congratulations. It is also with great pleasure that I introduce Plymouth, Plymouth's Employee of the Month honoree, Ms. Cherie Holguin. Are you here with your husband? Okay. And Cherie is here with her daughter, I believe, Emily, who is a Plymouth, Santa Fe, and Monrovia High School alum, I believe. Ms. Holguin has been at Plymouth since 2004, we believe, when her daughter was a first grader in Mrs. Rico's class. She attended, Ms. Holguin attended a coffee with the principal with Dr. Hoon, the principal at the time, who was recruiting playground aides, and she thought maybe she'd give it a try. So she had left a job in banking, and it didn't take long for her to fall in love with the Plymouth students and staff. Cherie has had a wonderful impact on our school. She worked as a playground aide for 11 years and continues to serve as an instructional aide in our kindergarten classrooms. I asked Cherie how she came upon her beautifully unique name, and her story caught me a bit by surprise. Some of you may remember the copper tone ads of the 70s. You don't have to admit if you remember that, <laughs> where the dog is biting onto a girl's swimsuit. Well, Ms. Olguin's mom claimed that the girl in the copper tone ad was named Cherie and she thought that it would make a wonderful name for her daughter. 
Cherie told me she never found out if that was true and suspects that her mom may have been mistaken and made it up. <laughs> well, I did a little Google research <laughs> and I found out that the girl generally credited with being the original Coppertone girl was indeed named Cherie. <laughs> so I guess mom was right. <laughs> Cherie's impact on Plymouth is better captured by the words of our staff. I asked our Plymouth staff to speak about her, and I'll read some of what they said. Cherie has the ability to brighten anyone's day. She has a contagious smile with a positive attitude. When she asks how your day is going, she genuinely listens, and if things aren't looking as bright as can be, she'll even follow up a day or two later to find out if things have improved. In the years I have known her on staff, I have never heard her utter an unkind word. She spreads kindness and a positive spirit in her interactions with staff, students, and parents. The kids love her and so do all of the teachers. She's a great listener and is a thoroughly and genuinely good person, which is rare to come by. Cherie has been one of the kindest and most supportive people in our school for years. She always has a smile and a kind word for everyone. She has a genuine love and appreciation of children, and it is evident in the way she cares for children. She is so kind, helpful, and supportive of other staff members, and is as dependable as anyone could ever ask for. We are really lucky to have her at Plymouth. So it's truly an honor to announce Cherie Olguin as Plymouth's Classified Employee of the Month. It's always great to meet the people who do the great job in our district and find out some more of the intimate details. And before everybody leaves, I would like to thank two people. The families of the folks that work in our district also work in our district because there's many times when they're supporting the people who do our, on our staff. But to drive from Wrightwood once a week is above and beyond in dedication. Thank you so very, very much. <laughs> We're going to move on to board member reports and Ms. Lockerbie. Thank you, Vice President Hammond. There we go. Thank you. Um, I have recently, recently become the district liaison to MAFA which is the Monrovia Association for Fine Arts. Um, I, as a new board member and now a new liaison to MAFA, uh, last night was my first meeting with MAFA, and it was very exciting, and uh, it, was, it was quite an honor to be there. 
MAFA, which again stands for Monrovia Association of Fine Arts, their mission statement is to enhance the lives of those within our community through interaction with the arts, and also to increase the opportunities of our children through art education. And they're very excited about doing this. MAFA is an organization composed of artists within our community. Attending last night's meeting were artists whose mediums included, but were not limited to, sculptors, pencil artists, watercolorists, graphic designers, oil painters, acrylic painters, contemporary, and pastel artists. Some in attendance were artists that have painted some of the electrical boxes around town. So you see all of our beautiful electrical boxes, um, the Charlie Chaplin, the, um, the, the butterflies and the flowers, all of those around town. Um, some of those um, artists are um, part of MAFA. So to let you all know, MAFA, anyone can join MAFA. They welcome artists, volunteers, and business patrons. And just to let everybody know, um, some of their upcoming events for 2019 are the monthly member meetings, and they're always the fourth Tuesday of every month. And as I mentioned, anyone can join. February 10th is the Heart in the Arts Cabaret and Art Show. And um, I will get back to that one <laughs> uh, after this slide. Uh, the 29th, June 29th, 27th, and August 24th are their summer art walks here in the community, which are always fun and exciting to go and see all of the, uh, the local artwork. First week in August is the Foothill Unity Center Back to School Kids Art Workshop. Midsummer, we have an annual juried art show. October 5th is the 55th annual Celebrate the Arts Show and Chalk Fest. This year, it's going to be in Station Square. It's usually in uh, Library Park. I'm not sure. It's, is it usually in Library Park? Yeah. This year, they've moved it to Station Square. December, there's a Foothill Unity Holiday Distribution Kids artwork. And eighth is the Mafa Holiday Party. So as I mentioned, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Heart in the Arts Cabaret and Art Show. Everyone is welcome. Um, the people there at MAFA have expressed their hope that everyone on the board and in the cabinet and uh, in the district are able to attend this. It's Sunday, February 10th from 5 to 8, and it's a pre-Valentine's night event. So there is dinner. Our own center stage is going to be having a production there. And there's going to be art on display from our MAFA artists. Um, they, you, if you are an artist, you can go and display your art, and you can also sell your art there. There's dinner, a no-host um, bar, and it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. So tickets are $25 in advance, $35 at the door. You can find out more information if you go to uh, MAFA's website. So that sounds like a really fun evening, and I know they hope uh, everyone can attend. MAFA is eager, to say the least, to work with our schools and our students. Um, they were just really thrilled to see the district's presence there. And um, I'm really excited and honored to be the representative and to help bridge that, um, that relationship between all of our students and art and the community. So um, that, was, uh, that was very exciting for me. I think that's my last slide. That's my last <laughs> slide. So that's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Travanti. Thank you. Good evening. Last Saturday, I attended the robotics tournament held at Santa Fe Middle School. This was the final round of FTC Robotics League before interleague competition begins on February 9th at our high school. The team suit bots from Monrovia High School, seen there on the slide, won first place and walked away with the Bryson Trophy. In second place was Hippie Bots from Clifton Middle School, and third place went to Graveyard Shift from Monrovia High School, and fourth place to Kings and Queens, also from Monrovia High School. We were well represented uh, with teams from Monrovia High School, Clifton Middle, and Santa Fe Middle, and they all showed really well. Students take on various tasks and roles on their team, such as builders, drivers, coders, and um, coaches. And they all take their roles very seriously. 
And I was proud to see how they all interacted and displayed good sportsmanship um, while focused on their roles. If you haven't had the opportunity of attending one of these tournaments, please do. They get very exciting and very intense. The craftsmanship and the design of these robots and what they are required to accomplish leaves you very impressed. So I'd like to thank um, all the setup crews, the parent volunteers, and those setting up uh, the constant tournaments that are going on. I would also like to thank all the teachers and mentors involved with our very robust robotics programs throughout the district. Hope to see you all at Monrovia High School February 9th as we kick off Interleague Robotics Tournament. Thank you. Thank you. The one meeting of note that I had during the last couple of weeks was the Monrovia Day planning. Um, this year, Monrovia Day will be held on Saturday, May the 18th. Um, the uh, Monrovia Unified School District partners with the city of Monrovia to put the Monrovia Day celebration on. Um, we use it as a platform for us to display all the wonderful things that are happening in our district and making the community aware of uh, programs like the robotics programs, um, like our arts programs that we have at Wild Rose and other schools in our music. Um, it's a fantastic day for you to put on your calendar, May the 18th. Uh, the parade will kick off, I think, at 9 o'clock in the morning. It will last approximately one hour. It will showcase marvelous bands from the Monrovia Unified School District, as well as we're Almost every child will have an opportunity in our district to participate somehow in the parade. So we'll look forward to seeing everybody there and you'll hear lots more about it as we get closer to the date. Up next, we have our student board member report and Jared is here to tell us about all the wonderful things happening on campus. Sure. <laughs> That's good evening, President. Oh. My bad. No, Vice President Hammond, I forgot he's not here. <laughs> uh, members of the board, Dr. Thorosian and Cabinet. On behalf of Canyon Oaks and Mountain Park, I would like to welcome our newest board members, Mrs. Uh, Maritza Turavanti and Mrs. Celine Lockerbie. They have, uh, they have both already visited our school sites and are eager to continue improving the quality of education we have grown to expect in the Monrovia Unified School District. We look forward to working with you both. I am pleased to report that Canyon Oaks High School and Mountain Park School have, <clears throat> have begun our second term last Monday, January 14th. We have several new students at both, Canyon, <clears throat> at both Canyon and Mountain, and they all seem to be acclimating very well. Also, our SBAC enrichment courses for juniors are in full effect. We have the junior classes split into two groups that rotate weekly between math and English courses. Lastly, we are happy to see the paintings done by Helen Montes Valle, Rebecca Lover, and Alina Arkenberg with the help of Miss Shannon Fitzpatrick. That is all I have to report for tonight. We would like to wish you all a happy new year. Happy new year to you as well, and thank you very much for your report. Appreciate it. Welcome. Up next, we have our report from the superintendent. I have a few photos to, to share with you. We were able to recognize Nathan Hickey for his work uh, and his pictures from his ride. Uh, LA County Supervisor Catherine Barger invited Nathan and uh, Principal Kirk McInnes, who you also see pictured there, uh, to the county supervisor's meeting yesterday yesterday and where he was recognized for his good work and it was a pleasure to see him as well as his parents. Uh, we also have with uh, the Monrovia Duarte Black Alumni Association Black History Month events. Uh, February 7th uh, at Monrovia High School is the Art Festival and we have a couple of movie nights scheduled at Clifton Middle School and Santa Fe Computer Science Magnet School. Uh, these these events, as well as the, the reading uh, that's done to, with our students during the school day, truly enrich their lives. And so we're very grateful for their uh, support and their uh, generosity with time. Finally, we have some Chinese visitors visiting uh, Plymouth, Mayflower, and Brad Oaks Elementary Schools. 
And they'll be here at all of those schools all week, sitting in classes, learning, and taking tours of the school as well. I know that Ms. Wu has been visiting each of the schools and making sure that they are well taken care of. So thank you, Ms. Wu, for coordinating all of that. And that, con that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Up next for public comments, there's two ways to address the board. One is to speak on items that are on the agenda and other way to speak on items that are not on the agenda. Simply fill out a speaker card and you shall be heard. Uh, up first will be public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Ms. Tuff, do we have any comments? There are none. Anyone in the audience wishing to address the board on any item that is not on the agenda? Seeing and hearing no one, we'll close that portion and take up the matter of public comments for items on the agenda. Do we have any speakers? There are none. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak to the board on any matter that is on the agenda? Seeing and hearing none, we'll close that mo uh, portion and move on to information, informational reports. And up first is Ms. Wu on the audit report for the 17 18 yes. year. And good evening, Mr. Hammond, Board of Education, Superintendent Dr. Torosian, <laughs> and Cabinet, staff member, and the committees. The district independent audit firm, Mouse Levy Hassan, they finished the district's 17 18 school year financial audit, and they issued a clean report. The current report means that uh, there's no funding on district compliance for the state program. There's no funding for the um, error on the financial statement and uh, uh, no funding on the federal award and the state award, which means that the district comply on the rule regulation when we um, conduct the program and uh, uh, finding the report. So uh, when the auditor um, prepare their report. They follow the um, government accounting standard board, which is GASB 68 and 75, require the auditor when they finalize the district report, the report need including the pension liability as well as any other first important benefit the district provide in the, in the district. Uh, in our district, we do not provide uh, uh, other post employment benefit, but we do have the pension li liability. So the report including the pension liability, which the number is come from the state, which is stores and purse. And we as an organization, we always want to improve our operation. And we have an auditor observe our operation and uh, provide some recommendations. So uh, the recommendation is that the auditor uh, recommend us to, in order to do manual recording and uh, use the electronic timekeeping system. And uh, uh, we will postpone that implementation because uh, the county of education is studying their financial statement system and uh, the um, human resource system. So in order to make sure that uh, uh, number one, whether their system provide the um, time tracking. Number two, we want to our, even if they don't, we want to make sure our system purchase will be able to integrate their system. So we don't postpone that uh, recommendation. The second one is the internal control over the ASB. And as a board aware that uh, ASB involve a lot of cash, so we can always uh, you know, enforce the, the accountability and control uh, over the cash. Collection. The last thing is employee accumulated vacation balance, and this is the history behind this. You know, the board recall that uh, a couple of years ago, um, because of the state of financial situation, we a lot of school districts, including Monrovia, we uh, implement follow days. So um, this means that because of follow day, maybe some of the staff did not take the vacation, so they have uh, um, vacation accumulate. And also, when there's an uh, employee um, the staff um, out there, and some of the, the duties will be spread out on the team. So this may another reason for employee were not able to take the vacation. So the district will continue monitor the situation and make sure that uh, um, in the normal operation years, the employee will take the vacations. Any questions of Ms. Wu? Um, for the audience at home um, and here, um, the budget and the implications from the budget and is routinely discussed repeatedly throughout the year. And so while the audit is something that's done a year in review to make sure everything was done correctly last year, there are some corrections, as Ms. Wu um, indicated, that we'll be watching for the next year. 
um, but I don't want to let the lack of questions about an item as important as the audit. Um, it's just that we review this constantly, so all the questions are answered in real time for us. Um, and then the um, audit is then made public, so that anybody from the public who would like to read it, it's here and available to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wu. Mm -hmm. Up next, we have um, our facilities master plan. And Ms. Wu, would you make yes. some introductions, please? Yeah. Um, board, as you recall, that uh, um, the board approved the district high NAC architect firm to do the facility master plan. And tonight, um, Michael Pito, the principal of the um, principal architect from the NAC architect firm, and his team to present the information to the board. And they would like to get the board feedback, answer the question before they finalize our report. So, Michael, would you like to introduce your team and present the report? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can we go full screen on that so it will advance? Or is that maybe it will? Okay, um, so uh, let me introduce our team. We've got uh, members of NAC Architecture, that's, uh, that's our firm. Uh, I wanna introduce Timo Forster. He was the one who coordinated all the visits to all the school sites, and that was a lot of time spent uh, in the district. Uh, we have Louise Griffin. Uh, she is helping do a lot of the writing that will be in the report. Uh, Simon Ubi. Uh, from Henderson Engineers, our uh, representative from a mechanical and electrical engineering firm, and Aldrin Oru from KPFF Structural Engineers. So members of the board, cabinet, Dr. Tarosian, members of the community, thank you for allowing us the chance to show you where we are, give you an update of our progress. Uh, as Ms. Wu uh, just mentioned, our goal would be to uh, show you a little bit about what we've been doing and get some feedback. So as we close in and finalize the report, we think we have about a month left to, to finish this up, um, that we can respond to any comments uh, that you may have as we go. Uh, okay, does that work? Okay, so just as a reminder of uh, what we were charged to do, um, is that the master plan, uh, the last master plan that you have was dated 1995. Um, and so in order to update that master plan, we were asked to do three primary things. One, uh, assess the, the condition of existing buildings and structures and grounds. Um, two, an ADA transition plan. Uh, you may know that ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, and that covers uh, issues of accessibility to people of different uh, abilities on your campuses. And third, uh, cost. How do we assess the value of work that, that we think needs to be done on the district sites? Um, so maybe just to uh, start with, uh, you know, we often talk about, well, what do facilities want to be? And many of your facilities may have been built at the time where education looked a lot like this. People sitting in rows, facing forward, uh, really not talking too much, and education has changed. And when we see your uh, teachers of the year and, and various people coming up and talking about what's going on in the classroom, I think you know that there's a lot more diversity in the way education is being delivered today. And how do we, uh, how do we help our facilities adapt to the changing changes in education? Um, so our charge was to uh, start uh, back in August, and just this is a little bit of a schedule of where, where we were and how we got here. Um, we did our, uh, most of our facilities assessments in the heat of August, so Timo uh, really was loving August. Um, <laughs> and then uh, as we got into the year, uh, the, the engineers and the roofing assessments, uh, those all took place, and we're right now at the point where all that data has been collected, is being compiled, uh, and we're finishing up the cost estimating. Um, so a little bit about the structure of our report. Uh, so first, uh, updating the master plan. As I said, the master plan existed uh, and uh, had an, a, a lot of data back in 1995. There hasn't been a lot of work uh, that's, uh, that's changed radically the campuses, so that was a great starting point. Uh, there has been a lot of maintenance, a, a lot of ongoing work. We know that there's HVAC work going on, so there's a lot going on, but the, but the base structure of the campuses are still intact from that date. Um, we'll be looking at the key data of buildings and sites so we can give you information about what you have in your district, a kind of inventory. 
uh, that assessment, the ADA assessment. Uh, we're looking at various levels of modernization. How do we assess uh, what, uh, what needs to happen in each of, the, each of the buildings and then the cost? So uh, as I said, we've compiled a lot of data and just we're, we're gonna go through and show you some of the things that you'll expect to see in the report. We're not gonna go through each campus for each topic. I'm gonna show you one sample campus or maybe two to give you a sample of what you can see. Um, so here's a site plan of uh, Mayflower uh, Elementary. For each campus, we compiled data from existing uh, drawings, um, uh, site visits, and compiled those into drawings that you can use going forward to uh, refer and have be a base from which to uh, re uh, create uh, information and strategies. Uh, those, uh, those maps and site plans then form the backbone for uh, a series of photo documentation. So for you and particularly the community who may want to see uh, what's going on in campuses that they may not be visiting, we, we, uh, we visited every room in the district. Um, and so this gives you uh, a window into the facilities across the, across the district. Um, each uh, site has uh, a kind of key data uh, sheet uh, that goes through enrollment, uh, the year it was built, uh, site area, uh, building area and uh, and then on subsequent pages we have uh, it broken down by building by building sorry this is a little small for you probably to see um, but building by building the area of that building uh, and uh, the year each building was built um, when we get into uh, when we get into each site we look at, we, we do an inventory building by building room by room so what we're really trying to do here is assess teaching stations. We know this district, like many districts in the area across Southern California, has experienced declining enrollment. So this gives us a window into uh, what is the capacity of each campus and what is the enrollment of that campus. And we, we know that across the district there, there is excess capacity. And this looks at uh, it broken down by uh, type of classroom from kindergarten, uh, first through fifth, labs, music and art specialty classrooms, and at the high school, it's even more broken down. Um, so uh, similarly here at Brad Oaks, another uh, window into, the, uh, into that school. And so um, as we go through here, for example, uh, I think that's four, uh, 462, but this campus has a, camp a capacity of upwards of almost 700. So those are the kinds of things that I think you as a district are gonna be wrestling with. Um, as we go through uh, site analysis, um, we start looking deeper into the quality of, of each of the buildings uh, in, and the campus grounds, um, and really looking uh, through photo documentation. And we have this digitally also that will allow you to have a tool that you can click on uh, individual parts of this map uh, to be able to bring up information about each of those uh, areas. Um, and, uh, and each of these areas is then kind of graded on a, on a scale to be able to help us uh, as we compile costs, assess how much, uh, how much dollars one could put to those to bring them up to a standard that I think you're looking for. Um, and that goes through from both buildings and into site, um, inside and outside. So, um, and then uh, going into the middle schools, Santa Fe, both outside and inside, and collecting, uh, again, that window into the campus all around. Uh, ADA assessment. One thing I want to mention about ADA, uh, and maybe you're familiar, but um, Americans with Disabilities Act is both a code, a building code that we respond to, but it's also a law. And that's one of the reasons why I think we were asked to make sure that that was part of this report, is uh, districts oftentimes need to have a uh, transition plan that helps the public understand a schedule and a cost uh, and direction for addressing those uh, barriers of accessibility. And so we have uh, put together on that same site map a series of keyed uh, photographs and observations that identify those barriers that need to be addressed. Um, and that is currently going through cost estimation at this moment as well. And again, that's 
There are site barriers in terms of sites that may have slopes that can't be accessed uh, without handrails or assistance to interiors where you may have uh, even doorknobs that are not uh, able to be used by people with disabilities, drinking fountains. There are a number of kinds of issues that uh, have to get dealt with. Um, and uh, again, the photographs document those. I mean, you see in the middle top photograph, uh, pipes under a sink uh, that need to be wrapped to pre prevent someone who's in a wheelchair from burning uh, legs as they slide under uh, towards the sink. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, one of the things that when we first were introduced to the board was, was about cost and how do we assess the total value of what we uh, need to do. Um, and most of, what, uh, most of what we think needs to be done, uh, I think there was a question about, we really wanna find those urgent issues. What are the things that if we don't deal with right away, uh, we, we have problems? And I will say the good news is we don't find that many issues that are of this level of urgency. There are definitely issues that should be prioritized, um, but we're not finding the kinds of issues that, uh, that are urgent that anyone should close a, a campus or close a building. Um, uh, structural did a series of structural observations. We did the systems uh, uh, observations uh, and the, the HVAC, HVAC systems, for example, that are the oldest are the ones that you're doing right now through Prop 39. So other than that, everything is fairly current uh, in terms of HVAC systems. That being said, uh, there is deferred maintenance to deal with. Uh, in your in your district, and those things do add up. These are old buildings, uh, and there is significant amount of wear and tear. Um, and so, just in a kind of big picture, uh, when we're looking at the elementary schools, we're finding uh, we could spend 15 to 40 million dollars at each of the elementaries, 50 to 70 at the middle schools, and up to 160 to 190 uh, at the high school, Monrovia High School. Um, now, I will tell you that those numbers may sound really large. Right now, we're doing uh, a full renovation of Venice High School uh, without touching uh, half of the campus except for ADA. So we're, we're modernizing half of the campus pretty fully. Half of it, we're, we're doing just ADA upgrades, and that's about a $120 million project. So these numbers are big, they sound big, but they're in line with what we're seeing at uh, other districts around uh, Southern California. I wanted to go in a little deeper. When we were first introduced to you, uh, there were specific questions about roofing, so I thought that would be a good one to zoom in on for a moment. So we have costs broken down beyond those big picture numbers, but when we look at cost trends uh, at campus by campus, just in terms of roofing, we find almost $9 million worth of roofing repair uh, to be done across the district. Now, not all of that is of an urgent variety. Some of it is roofs that are in poor condition and should be dealt with as a higher priority. Um, so when we look across the district, there, are, uh, there is money that should be spent relatively soon. Um, at each district, or at each campus, we put together a heat map, what we call a heat map. Uh, and the heat map color codes those buildings that are most uh, in need of attention. Um, now, in this case, and this is a question that I think would be something to, to offer, we'd love some feedback on. Um, we have portables that are in poor condition. Uh, portables uh, that in many cases, if we do a capacity analysis on the campus, may not be needed, that you could fit the, the number of students you have on a district site in the permanent buildings that are of a better quality. So the question is, when we start doing cost estimation, we can put a cost of replacement of portables uh, at a portable cost. We can put a cost of replacement of building new buildings at a new building cost. We could say, remove those portables. Or we could say, renovate those portables. I don't recommend renovating portables. Um, now, this, this gets into when we, when we give you this final report with cost, uh, costs associated with it, there's a lot of space in portables and the swing of a total number 
will be greatly impacted by how we categorize those portable buildings. Um, now, I will say that when we look at capacity, um, I don't completely know at the moment all of the perhaps uh, community uses that may happen in all those portable buildings. You know, that on, on Mondays, uh, Boys and Girls Club is in one, and on Tuesdays, there's an after school program. And those programs are obviously all important. I don't know that they can't happen in other spaces. So those are, those are the kind of fine-grained uh, discussion that I think could continue. Um, so uh, Brad Oaks may be uh, at the other end of the scale where we have more buildings in red, including some permanent buildings. Now that doesn't mean that the building needs to be torn down. Uh, we, often, uh, we often say that uh, there is a tipping point in the assessment of buildings when a building, the cost of renovation of a building reaches over half its replacement cost, that's where we call it vulnerable to demolition, meaning that uh, a district may say it is better use of our funds to think about replacing that building than to renovate it, to put money into an existing building that is of that age and of that condition. Um, so as we conclude, um, there are a number of themes emerging. Um, so it's not all just about deferred maintenance, um, although that was our primary focus, the, the condition of buildings, and that's the first item, uh, building condition and deferred maintenance. We know that there are issues of accessibility uh, that uh, have not been addressed to date and, and should be. Uh, I mentioned the aging portables. Uh, I mentioned capacity, uh, that there is excess capacity. Um, we, we, we often talk about campus identity, and that's the, in any kind of facilities program, the community always wants to see that the, the schools are being taken care of, and how does that front door, that entry, that, and it's important for the students too when they arrive and feel pride in their campuses. So, so we always, when we think about where to focus money, we always think about that front door, that, that entry, that interface with the community. Um, specialty programs, uh, the sciences, arts, music, those things that are in unique building, unique classrooms, unique buildings, how do we uh, fit those kinds of specialty programs in there? Uh, and 21st century learning. We know learning is changing. Um, when we first met with Dr. Tarasian, we asked her, What's, what, do we, what do you think that makes the district special? And she said it was the people, the teachers, the students, and giving them those places to do all the creative things that, they, that we've heard so much that they can do is, is the, the benefit of having uh, a vision for your facilities. And so I, I just include this because when we think about a district that might have some excess capacity, um, there are some opportunities in that. And when we look at the top diagram, the traditional model of schools, classroom by classroom, uh, each, each school, each classroom kind of separated from the next, uh, versus as you go down, uh, classrooms where, where students move perhaps outdoors, where students perhaps move between classrooms where there's project-based learning, and we've heard about some of those kinds of things. And when you have potentially extra uh, excess capacity, it affords you the opportunity to think about doing things that make your classrooms more flexible, that uh, perhaps allow you to take down a classroom to put in a STEM lab or a courtroom or to, to facilitate those kinds of specialty programs. Whoops, am I doing that? There we go. Um, so uh, I'm sure you've heard this before, but what is 21st century thinking? We're really trying to think about fostering critical thinking, communication, that opportunity for collaboration. How do the students really work together? Creativity, and we saw so much creativity today. Um, and so uh, we weren't really charged with redesigning the campuses. So what we chose to do, uh, to give a, a little something as a, a hint towards what could come, were a series of diagrams that talked about thinking about how you could change your campuses uh, to accommodate some of that. So for example, on the right diagram, how do you connect indoor and outdoor spaces? And, though, and to a certain degree, outdoor spaces are a little bit of the low-hanging fruit from a cost perspective. Creating those outdoor classrooms where students can uh, go out uh, if they need to in order to uh, continue their learning or break into groups. Or uh, the other lo low-hanging fruit is uh, in the middle, furniture. There's so much uh, in, the, in the field of furniture design for schools right now that allows students to 
be sitting listening to a lecture, but then group their their little workspaces and chairs and tables uh, around a project. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and again, thinking about the lawns uh, and using those uh, fields for uh, joint use, creating buffer zones for outdoor learning. So we have a series of these diagrams or things that we think are the opportunities. Um, and, and thinking about uh, shade and lunch shelters, um, bringing natural light and daylight, uh, and actually even uh, common spaces like cafeterias and auditoriums to have other types of uses that happen in there. So I think with that, that is where we are. Uh, we have uh, a few weeks left to compile the data and we would love any feedback uh, or questions for our technical team uh, as we finish this up. Thank you very much for a detailed report. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> um, is creating a new, uh, this perhaps is not for you, is creating a new facilities master plan um, a mandate? No, I, I can answer. Um, no, but what we needed to do as a body, the, the board, is to understand what it was, what we were looking at into the immediate future and to the long range future of what our district will look like. Um, usually you get a facilities master plan before you go out and get a bond. That's usually the precursor to a bond. This, in this case, that is not the case. Um, we have a lot of years of deferred maintenance here. Things that, because the funding, as you are finding out, is not exactly fluid as it comes to a school district. So you take care of the people first and you let the buildings kind of sit. And we have let the buildings sit here for quite a while. Even though we have passed bonds in 1996 and in 2006, um, they didn't meet all the needs that needed to be taken care of. And of course, once you stop working on a building, as in the case of the elementary schools on the first bond that was passed, you're, you're looking, that was 23 years in the rear view now. Doesn't, it seems like yesterday to me, but to that building, it's been, it's been seeing the sun hit it and the rain hit it and the wind hit it and people use it for 23 years without us putting a significant amount of money and keeping it up and going other than the fact you slap on some paint and do something. And so the, the board needed to know, what are we facing here? As we're looking at you know, making sure that we can pay our staff um, a, a really good wage, um, we wanted to make sure that we weren't taking the money that we should be holding back a little bit and maybe putting into the place that the people who are paying have a decent place to work into. And so that was the purpose of putting a facilities master plan together so that we as a body start prioritizing what these things are. Okay. It's like that, that one thing was the roofs. Um, that was one of the big issues back in 1996. We actually, not we, we were not here. None of us were here. But some folks that were here actually put some new carpet in the schools, yet they didn't fix the roofs in the schools. So when it rained, that new carpet that they put in got damaged. We, we don't want to be the ones that do that. We want to make sure that what we're doing is being responsible, and not that they were irresponsible, but we want to work it from the top down, not from the bottom up. And so that was the reason for doing this facilities master plan. They are quite expensive to do, but when you get through, you'll have a blueprint for what you're faced with. But um, as you mentioned, there, there is some ADA compliance issues. So what is the timeline for becoming compliant with um, our ADA needs? So uh, we are currently putting a cost estimate for that together. The, the ADA work cost estimate is still happening. Um, you know, uh, Connie uh, had mentioned to me that uh, it would be helpful to get a sense of what a deferred maintenance budget might be. And what we're finding is that uh, three to five percent is what we see most districts devoting towards three to five uh, deferred maintenance. That being said, a district that has fallen behind, we've seen districts as high as 13 and a half percent going towards deferred maintenance. Um, so deferred maintenance, ADA compliance, uh, I think when, when we have the final cost estimate, we can start to put together a schedule that you think you can bite off. Um, but it's gonna take some time. 
I, I probably wasn't clear about my question. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what is our timeline? Is the CDE or LACO or anyone going to come to us and say you have a certain amount of time to become compliant? The way ADA works is if we never touch this building, it sits like this until it crumbles and falls. But the minute we try to do something to it, then all the rules that are current Got then it. have to be brought to bear. And so if, I guess the short answer is as long as we don't touch it, it I can understand. stay like this, but that's probably not the right answer. Um, I have a question about um, a law that I, I can't quote, um, but it is our San Gabriel Water, San Gabriel Valley Water proposition. We just talked about it last meeting. Do you know what I'm talking I about? I do know what you mean, yes. So um, is your company, what, what is that? Can you, do you know what that's well, called? Well, I do, but it really doesn't come to bear on, on the facility side. Where it comes to bear is when we're talking about it's how implementation of, of right, this how though. we're going to be capturing, like if you're going to be doing roofs, how do we capture some of the water and right. how do we direct it? Um, what so goes are you on? compliant with um, those mandates that we are under? Storm water. It's storm water. Yeah. So uh, you uh, that it similar to the way you just talked about uh, ADA is the same for water right. until until you do a project that changes the, the way water infiltrates on the site. So for example, if you built a new building that took away permeable ground, you would have to do stormwater plan. Uh, given that you, we're, at least in this plan right now, we're not talking about new buildings uh, per se. Th th we're this not, is so not a plan as much as it is an evaluation. An evalu right? It's an update to the previous master plan through evaluating existing buildings. Yes, and if, if just going back to ADA for one moment, um, what you said was exactly right. From a code perspective, if you don't touch a building, you don't have to do anything. However, it, ADA is also a law, and so it, the, the law requests that you have this transition plan that puts you on a track towards compliance. Anyone who, is, uh, who owns a building is at risk of lawsuit for someone who couldn't access your facilities. But the, but the code does not require compliance until you touch it. Any other questions? Do you have a question? I have more, but go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Maritza? No, go wait. It comes, it, comes, it comes to the chair. S go ahead. <laughs> oh, um, when you, you were talking about shade, mm -hmm. um, do you consider solar panels as something that can facilitate shade and Absolutely. also bring us into the 21st century in terms sure. of our um, looking at Absolutely. electricity and energy? Yes. I'm done. You can have as many questions as well. <laughs> um, other questions? Cool. Sure. Thank you for being here tonight and answering sure. all our questions and giving us this presentation. I, I have more clarifying um, questions. So on the cost trend slide under roof modernization estimates, um, is this in order here of urgency or is this just? I think, I hope it's alphabetical. Okay, all yeah. right. So, I, so when we do receive the actual plan, mm -hmm. everything will be in order of urgency? So uh, we will probably do do both. Um, there will okay. be just the tabular data, and then we're going to highlight those things that we think are priorities. And and there is a, a level of urgency with with each. Okay, because that's really really important right. for us. Yes. Okay, and on the screen for heat map uh, modernization, the top one is Mayflower, the bottom one is is Brad yep. Oaks. I appreciated you on the top indicating what were the um, portables. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not on Brad Oaks. Do you know off the cuff which ones are the portables at Brad Oaks? Timo, do you remember? Brad Oaks. Well, those streets are wrong if that's Brad Oaks. And the streets are wrong, did yeah. you say? Oh, yeah, that's East Palm and Canyon. Yeah, that's not Brad Oaks. That must be uh, Clifton. I don't think yeah, that's Clifton. It is. Yeah. The streets would be Clifton. Right, no, the streets are Clifton if that's... 
site plan would be from uh, Brad Oaks. So the portable buildings are the ones at the top left bottom, uh, sorry, left bottom. Uh, so L, M, G, H, F, K, and E. And uh, at the top, R, Q, and N. And then J is kind of a portable s style building. It's like a mixed. It's a, a, more of a modular, modular building. OK, J is modular building? Yeah. yeah. OK. There, there will be another diagram in the report that goes through specifically what, uh, what type of uh, building it is, portable or permanent. OK, thank you. That was it. Clarifying comment? The mod what does modular mean? So there are many types of ways schools have been built through time. Uh, we refer to stick built as the buildings that have, are custom built. They are often built a uh, wood frame. You, you may have concrete frame buildings or other things, but they're, they're designed for that use. They have been built from a set of plans specifically for use on your sites. Portable buildings are those uh, buildings that are built in a factory and brought in. Modular is kind of a hybrid. Uh, so they are built from uh, prefabricated components and there, there have been many varieties of modular construction, these semi-prefabricated structures that often uh, districts have used because they save time in construction and are less disruptive to your sites. Typically they're permanent versus Right. <laughs> Easily put wheels on. Right. We, we don't see the get rid of portables. <laughs> Since that's how it is in housing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it would be helpful for everybody in the audience who's listening first to take a step back to understand why we did this. So even though it has the word plan in it, it's really not a plan. It's an evaluation. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to one of the comments that Rob was making about uh, the carpet which is we have, this is classic economics. We have limited funds and unending wants and needs. Uh, so we have to be very prudent with how we're spending the money. It's just not a faucet we turn on and we just keep spending. So before we start making repairs to any of the buildings or any of the sites or any of the problems that we can readily identify, we need to know what the big picture is. We need to know, is this something we want to spend our time and money on? Uh, or is this a, a building that perhaps we shutter in five years? Uh, or is it that we have excess capacity and we can take that uh, building down to the ground? What are our options? I mean, th there is no plan in place on what we want to do. The reason we're doing this is so we can properly identify what the expenses would be and what the various options would be. So as we look at this, I mean, the first thing that pops out, I mean, you don't have to know anything about anything, and you realize if it costs $15 million on the low end for each elementary school, $50 million for each middle school, and $160 million for the high school on the low end to bring things up, that's not going to work. Plain, plain and simple. This city is not large enough and cannot support a bond issue even to meet the minimum responsibilities outlined on here and, and understanding this is just a, a quick thumbnail at this point in time and a rough estimate i'm not trying to hold your feet to the fire right. but there's no way that this city could support that type of a bond issue but that's part of the parameters of what we need to see we need to see the community needs to see what exactly um, needs to be done and what financial parameters that we have um, available to us. The most readily available to us are funds that we've been setting aside for a variety of products, uh, projects. Uh, over the years, we've been fairly prudent on a, a number of things that we want to do. But as we start looking at them, we're saying, really, is this the most important thing we can do with our limited resources? Uh, so, so one of the questions that was asked was, we need to have a priority list of worst case, we don't get any more money from anywhere else. What do we have to fix first before it's a health and safety issue, right? I mean, so I'm in the residential business, right? And first and foremost is always health and safety. I mean, and that's got to be done. Then we're looking at the things that we want to do. We know that ADA is an important issue, but 
if we don't have any legal obligations to do it at this point in time, is that our best dollar spent? Or perhaps do we rearrange things in such a way that uh, it, it meets the needs of our students without us having to expend tremendous amounts of money? So, you know, these are the types of things that as a board, we need to have this input so we can make some decisions. We may come to a conclusion at the end of the day, even though this is not the purpose of this, to say the only way we can meet these needs is indeed to do a bond. Uh, if, if we try to shuffle the deck as many times as we can and we still can't make things work, we have to figure out how to make this, how to make this go so that it is safe, right? I mean, that, that is one of our primary goals is to make sure our kids are safe. But when, as you're looking through this and you see how much excess capacity there is, I mean, it, it also presents opportunities, right? So, so there's opportunities. In a worst case scenario, the opportunity is to say, wow, we, we shutter this building, we save all the operational costs, we save all the repair costs, and, and we put this, this asset to a better use. I mean, that has a lot of problems with shuttering a school, and I'm not suggesting that in any way, shape. But that's, that's one extreme. You know, the other extreme is to say, you know, th these buildings were built 50 years ago, and there's better ways to teach, mm -hmm. as we had mentioned. And we've seen this in different schools. There's all the classrooms are not the same, and there's a reason for it. Some work better than others. Mm -hmm. Well, do we take a look at this as a board to say, we want this type of learning to occur, and in order to achieve this type of learning with the technology that we're putting in place, maybe it would be better if we restructured our classrooms. And I think these are the, the conversations that the board has to take into consideration before we give directions to anybody on what we want to do. Um, first is to know what the parameters are of the shape and condition of the buildings, right? And that, that in itself could be a guiding force on where we're gonna go. The second thing we need to do is, is realize how much funds we have readily available to us, set aside HVAC, for example, we know that's an issue. Roofing, we know that's an issue. A lot of these things we have budgets for and have game plans for, but at the same time, if we have set aside a million dollars for a roof on a building and then collectively we say, well, maybe this building isn't gonna be used anymore, okay, then, then why spend a million dollars on a roof that we're not going to use? So, so, you know, I want to make sure that the community understands we may be getting a lot of information here, but that doesn't mean that something is going to happen the next day afterwards because this is just, this is the cornerstone to the conversation that we have to do as far as what is the next step. What are we as a district wanting to accomplish? And what are our financial limitations to it? Uh, and, and before we go out to, to the public in any way, shape, or form, I want to be comfortable and confident that the plan we're going to be presenting is thoughtful and is forward-looking for more than this is the Band-Aid for this particular year, and who knows what next year is going to be. We hope this holds and we're going to see. Because unfortunately, Finances aren't that stable in the state. We have a period of time in which I think right now that we can take a look and do some planning, do a little bit of planning, try to get a, a game plan, a true plan in front of us. So, you know, I, I, I appreciate this. Uh, we take this as a first step. Um, and in, you know, and I want to make sure that I'm clear what my goal is to you so you understand what I'm looking at this plan for. So as you're putting together your report, you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind as what I'm looking for, right? I mean, I need to know buildings that are not worth saving. I mean, it is what it is, right? I mean, you, you've got costs here that are far exceed our, our best possible scenario to raise funds. So there needs to be this practical application to this report i mean it can't be so overwhelming that it's it's not useful right right may i um uh, so we have been in the situation before where we are w working with a district that has uh, identified need beyond uh any capacity for uh 
for accessing those level of funds. Um, but one of the things that uh, it does is it points out the need that unfortunately, there are very few ways that districts can fund facilities. And the, 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 the money that you get from the state per pupil funding does not cover the kinds of things that we're talking about. And so many districts have a facilities program that starts biting off chunks. And bonds is the way that often happens. Um, so when a district is confronted with uh, a level of need beyond the, the capacity, it's, it's time to start thinking long term. How do we develop a program that can start to sustain? And I think that's the thing that you as a board have to wrestle with. And how are we going to develop a facilities program in the absence of other types of funds that are available to districts? Because it, and, and these buildings are now reaching their age where you know it's the the warranty's over you know this is this is the time where where these buildings are in need of attention and there there are very few outlets as you say for accessing those kind of funds no i agree i think everybody would understand that you know they're hitting their physical life cycle i mean there's it's not that the district did a poor job no. it's just that's the way it goes Pe things aren't designed to last forever mm -hmm. we'd like them to we try to make them but it's just not practical right so we need to again try to figure out how to utilize our scarce resources in the best way possible and to maximize the use to benefit our students the most mm -hmm. and I do think that um, once we get through this list, it'll be much cleaner and it'll be much clearer to all involved on, um, you know, the basically the the economic life of all the various parts that you're identifying as red. I mean, that's a pretty scary picture just on just from a color scheme of saying, wow, that that's a lot of buildings. That's all of the buildings. I mean, just about mm -hmm. except for the office. I mean, now a lot of those are, are portables, mm -hmm. and I think that that definitely skews things uh, because portables definitely were not designed to, right. to last a lifetime. Uh, and so it may be time to pull those away, but that's all part of the discussion we need to have. Yeah. So, um, you know, I just want everybody to understand this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of a conversation. Uh, and I think once we have this information, it'll help us frame the conversations that we need to have. Um, you know, we have an ongoing conversation on attendance, um, how to improve it or keep it stable or what have you. But this is now something that needs to go into these plans uh, on something practical. Uh, because if we're at 50% of capacity, you know, that, that's something that needs to be addressed in some matter. I'm not saying w what it's going to be, but it needs to be addressed. Uh, and if we have that on nine different sites, that's a lot of capacity. I mean, and that's a lot of repair work that maybe doesn't need to be done. So uh, in any case, I just want to frame, frame this discussion a little bit better for people who are coming in the middle and not understanding what we're doing. And, and thank you, Brian. Um, and in fact, uh, appreciate everybody's questions because this is what we're giving these folks instruction to deliver back to us mm -hmm. so that we can look at the document. I have four items that I would like to have included in the um, next presentation. Um, in addition to the age of the building, uh, there was uh, slides where it showed the age of the year of construction. Mm -hmm. I am not so much interested in the age of the year of construction as I am in interest in the year that it was upgraded. So in Brad Oak's uh, case, there were significant upgrades done on their buildings um, from the uh, bond that was passed mm -hmm. in 1996, so, um, or 1999, whichever the case may be. It was done in the 90s mm -hmm. at some time. And so I like to know the, that year is when it was upgraded. Um, also on that, there's a picture of a uh, pipe that's coming off of a, fa a faucet um, looking at the construction on this thing, it looks relatively new. And the problem on the ADA part is that a person in a wheelchair could slide up in there and burn them a leg. 
th this is not something that needs to be taken care of in a year. This is probably something that needs to be taken care of tomorrow morning. And it probably can be resolved for $3.99 at mm -hmm. the Home Depot and some labor mm -hmm. uh, for folks that we have on staff. I would like to separate those items that can be um, readily handled by our current staff and, and something like that should be taken care of immediately. Um, the third is um, when we're looking at a problem, I'd like to have a date on when the assessment is that maybe it's not a critical problem today, but I see in the next five years. So I'd like to have a chronological order of when the problems become a major, the, the intermittent problems become a major problem so that we can look at that as well. I know you had, you had talked about it in your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to make it very clear this is an absolute must be addressed. Mm -hmm. You said there weren't that very many of them, mm -hmm. but some are gonna be coming up in the future. I want mm -hmm. to have that very clear. And lastly, and I think uh, Celine <laughs> brought it forward the best, is we have two brand new board members that are not used to all the um, colloquialisms that go on in school districts. I like to have a key of words mm -hmm. so that they can reference back to that so they can find out what exactly these terms mean. Sure. Um, nothing worse than reading something and it's like, oh, I don't know how to identify that. It's not fair. So I would like to have a key of all terms that are used, industry jargon that you guys talk about like your first names, right. uh, I'd like to have that in the report so it can refer, be referred back to so that's in simple English for, the, for sure. the rest of us that are reading it. Does anybody else have any more questions? I mentioned solar and you were talking about roofing. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to um, the opportunity to have solar be shade, can you somehow um, give us a plan about the roofing and solar. Um, does solar have to go on certain types of roofs? Um, if we change the roofing, will it will it hold solar panels? You know, like solar panels are probably not going to go on terracotta tiles. I'm um, some I'm assuming something like that. So can you? When you give us the um, overview of the roofing, can you let us know? You know that this can sustain solar panels or this can't? Um, so that requires a, a, a fairly detailed level of structural analysis and I'm looking at uh, yeah, our I saw everyone's face scrunch yeah. just now. <laughs> Do you want to? Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, just listening to some, you know, if you have some budget concerns, what you have to keep in mind is that um, if you desire to have more solar panels in, in, in your campuses and, you know, a roof is basically a, a good way to put it if, you, if you're building a new building and that's where we usually put it, but in an existing buildings of these age and these type of construction that we've seen, you're going to have to kind of retrofit the, the roof to support the solar panels. They sustain a lot of wind and the, um, you know, um, if they're laying flat, they're not just lay flat, they're usually at an angle. They, they act like a sail, which impose additional loads on the existing structure. And uh, most existing buildings that we put these type of solar panels would require some sort of retrofit. So if your desire is to increase the solar panel and you have a budget concern, it is probably your, your dollars are better spent putting in maybe adding some carports, some shade structures, something that's more in the new. That would be my recommendation. It's doable, but it, it costs I, I think if I understand the question, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Can we see in this report a, an appendix or a chapter that says adding solar costs this much money and this is what we would achieve because the goal would be to reduce the cost of our electricity. I mean, we need to make a balance out somewhere. So if we could add a chapter that says if you were able to add so many uh, solar panels, um, on campuses via uh, shade over existing parking lots, you would be able to accomplish this much and recapture this much money in energy costs. Is that the right question? Um, we, we can, we can uh, likely pull together a, a report on the potential a kind of solar analysis. The, I think where it gets tricky for us is the assessment of existing buildings. And, you know, there's uh, an Aldrin, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a tipping point that when that retrofit 
affects more than what percent of the building? Uh, we have to do the full upgrade? Yeah. If, yeah. if you put um, more than 10% of sort of, the, you're increasing the mass on, on the roof more than 10% of its weight. Now you're, the code triggers you to do a complete seismic evaluation of the entire building. Yeah. So there's also a limit to the amounts that you need to put, you can, you know, on an existing buildings. But um, if I understand, you were also speaking about maybe some assessment about putting new shade structures right. and ma making that. But on it, the existing structures, it could be a little tricky. Yeah, it, you know, I, I'm sorry. I, I just want to, again, make sure that we're going to evaluate what we already have. I, I, this is part of what I think the next phase is once we have an evaluation is to see what our options are. But I can tell you for fact that that's not going to work. I mean, we can't even put HVAC, a new HVAC on our roofs because it's, they're not stable enough and we have to have them re-engineered. So, so I'm just saying, if you can do it without any additional cost, uh, then, then I'm good. But if, if you're going to have to bring in some structural engineers to do some tests to determine uh, what, what I'm pretty comfortable with, the already answer is, I would prefer that uh, as a board we talk about expanding the services and, and how much it's going to cost to do that. So um, I, 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 the, the I, one thing I, I add, think is, it, toes, is in a situation like this where we're looking, I think if a board member has a concern or has a question about is there a cost savings around the thing, I think it's you know within our scope to ask if you could bring us some information on that. And so that way at least if the answer is no, it's based upon the science of the no rather yeah. than the feeling that it's no. Yeah, so uh, just giving a sense of where I think this will go is we can bring in someone to look at opportunities for solar. As Aldrin said, the opportunities are likely to be around new shade structures and that kind of thing. I would say in the last 10 years, solar panels have only ever penciled out on existing buildings if we were otherwise doing a full a, a fuller retrofit. And, and, the re, and the reason I think this is important is if we look back to 2006, when the original information went out to the community, it did not, did not include a sports facility at our high school. That was not what the intent was when it first was uh, talked about. It was through the discussion that it found out that the community really wanted to have a, a, a better sports facility. And had that not been there as part of the ask, it would have been a, probably a tougher sell to get what it is that we were really after in the beginning, which was the new science building. Mm -hmm. So we, we, have to, we want to be cognizant of that. So I think it's a very valid question to ask because yeah. maybe the idea that if you were to put new parking solar structures up and the, and the school district could save X amount of dollars a month, that is the trigger that makes a person look at this thing and go, you know, this is probably a thing I want to support and go in that direction. So I think it's valid to look at sure. it. Any other questions? Thank you guys very, very much for being here. Appreciate it. Sure, thank you. And appreciate the work so far. We, we, Brian and I have been waiting for this for five years. So <laughs> you know, we're, we're happy to see you all. And, and, and if I may just say thank you to Fernando Martinez, who came on midstream of this work and just hit the ground running and has been super supportive and uh, getting us things that we needed to, to get to this point. So Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Up next is we have our consent uh, agenda. Um, I understand uh, item number three would like to be pulled and put into its regular position. Are there any other um, changes to the consent calendar? If not, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Is there any discussion? Maybe please have a vote. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Vice President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. 
Up first, we have educational services. Dr. Kaiser will be giving the report on the LA County Office of Education contract to provide professional development for history. I am sorry, Dr. Kaiser. Uh, Board Member Pam, uh, sorry, Vice That's President. That's okay. I'm <laughs> I, I just wanted to call everybody's attention to the updated list of students for the extended field trip that was also included, and to make sure that in the in our uh, public oh. presentation we are rec we recognize that the list has been updated for the extended field trip, oh. and that was part of that uh, consent agenda. I apologize for interrupting Dr. Kaiser and. Uh. Uh, as well and as it's such a tier. thoughtful report too. I should have taken more time with it. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Yes, if it please the board, um, Vice President Hammond and board, the Los Angeles County Office of Education, we bring before you tonight a contract to provide professional development for the history social science teachers. We have the opportunity to bring to our history social science teachers, Michelle Herzog, who works for the Los Angeles County Office of Education to provide staff development for all of our secondary social studies teachers for the day. Michelle Herzog has served as the National Social, Social Studies Teacher President for the entire nation and has been very involved in setting policy in Sacramento regarding our current social studies framework and the materials that we, we use. She will be training our teachers on the FAIR Act and the new requirements that they are required to be teaching as per the framework. Any questions of Dr. Kaiser? Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? Maybe please have a vote. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Vice President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Up next, we'll go back into its order the individual service agreement in, in Dr. Uh, Jackson's absence. Dr. Kaiser will give the report. Yes, um, we have before you tonight the setting of the salary for the new classified um, classification of the systems analyst and the Board of Education is, is re, um, requested to set the salary for this new classified. I I, excuse me, Dr. Period. Kaiser, I apologize. I, I'm going to keep doing this, I suppose. Okay. I'm so sorry. The individual services agreement from the consent agenda that has been moved um, oh, into okay. uh, action is what I believe yes. uh, Vice President number Hammond three. was referencing. Um, number from, three. Number three from consent. Is yes. Um, let me just find it here. Yes, we have here an individual service agreement. The Board is, of Education is requested to ratify the amend, amended individual service agreements for the basic education and counseling services for special education students by Hillsides Education Center as detailed in the 2018-19 ISA Report 9. This is in regards to a non-public school that we pay for for our students to attend that are special ed students. Any questions of Dr. Kaiser? I just wanted to clarify. Uh, so the cost of this is $7,460, and that is for the basic education and counseling services for, special, uh, for these two um, special education students. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions of Dr. Kaiser? Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Is there any discussion? May we have a vote, please? Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Vice President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Up next is item number two on um, business services. Ms. Wu and a bid and award a contract for the fence at Brad Oaks. 
Yes, uh, Vice President Mr. Hammond, Board of Education, as you recall that uh, at the east side of uh, Bright, Oak, the, uh, Bright Oak Elementary School, there was trees um, served as a natural barrier and a protection that was removed due to disease. So installation of the fence will limit pro uh, access from the street and, and the parking lot and promote student safety through the better access control. Uh, we send out the, the um, vendors for the quota for the installer fencing and we receive two quotes. The second quota um, actually with the same fencing material and the $10,000 less. So we present the board for approved the second quota, which is $23,901 to install the wrong iron fencing at the east side of Bright Oaks. Did we happen to have a picture? Um, actually, I don't have a picture, but I have actual material in my office, <laughs> fencing in my office. It's a fence in there. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I just wanted to see what, uh, but that's okay. I, I, okay. Hey, you want. know what uh, um, my director can bring to you, so. <laughs> if you, it, we'll, we'll just keep moving forward, Dave, yes. if you want to grab that and we'll, we'll just keep going yeah. forward. Does anybody have any questions of uh, Ms. Wu? Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion and a second discussion. I wonder what that fence looks like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. We only had a sample. <laughs> I had asked earlier if um, we can paint it. Um, is that something that mm -hmm. we should entertain? It should be made to be matching what's existing correct yeah um painting is a good idea but also i want to um caution board we may um, occur maintenance issue because maintenance. when yeah maintenance so we may um finding something to decorate that fencing to represent the district and the side color will that uh, um, satisfy your um, request or need it was just a question that i thought i'd entertain the yeah Perhaps the the site was interested in in having it be other than black. I know it's a very verdant campus, and yes, I saw uh, some school and um, they put some um, type of the material and decorated the, the fence and it represented the site culture. So that probably uh, meet the needs and they are uh, lower the maintenance. But it can be painted if we wanted to. Yeah, that's yeah. the question. Right, <laughs> we're not. <laughs> so the heavier heavy. one. Hey, you need a giant D. Yeah, <laughs> the heavier one is the uh, is the one we propose for board approval. This one here. Yeah. <laughs> Does it match the existing fencing? The exist exist fencing actually is a white color. White. Yeah. Yeah. And this will be white as well. Yes. Yeah. And the existing fence really only goes around that small section around the cafeteria, right? right? Cafeteria. The little, the little mm -hmm. storage area. It's it's not even a lot of fencing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, we've done all of our due diligence with the, the campus folks and everybody's and the PTA and the parents. Yeah. And yes. The, okay. Yeah. The, the meeting was hosted before to discuss in the, that part of the fence on the campus. Uh, was there any opposition to putting the fence up? Uh, not on my will because we're not a totaling fence in the entire campus, it's just the total the east side. Right. Okay. The yeah. little parking lot. Mm -hmm. There's multiple styles, obviously, that we can do. And does the site have a preference to which one they want? Do they know what we're going to do? Um, no, because we uh, talk about a lot of vendor and the, the quality of the material and the pricing. Um, I think we will prefer the that one because the, 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 the way they will construct. But we will definitely ask the site for their input. Before we finalize, are the costs the same for those two? No, um, the cost okay, is. Well, we have a bid in front of us. What is yeah, this bid the, for? The cost is uh, um, not that the difference between between these two material. Cost is a couple of thousand, but the other material will be uh, stronger, last longer. So the ten thousand mm -hmm. dollar difference. Uh, is the, not between these two. Yes, it's the company. It's the, it's the company. The, the 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 two bids. The the one. Yeah. Okay, but you put out a bid for something. Is it for 
fence one or fence two? I mean, you're telling me that they're two different costs, right? That's correct. Um, okay, so Ms. Wong, in the in the package, um, the the vendor submitted the um, quote. The top quote, the twenty three thousand dollar nine hundred one dollar, is actually for the for the the raw iron. The the second quote for twenty thousand fifteen dollar is for the ornament iron and iron, which uh, Mr. Um, Galliland uh, request. The, the the similar material we put fencing around the Mayflower. Okay, but yeah. you're asking us to to approve the bid of one of those two. Which two are we approving the bid um, for? The first one, the one we request the board approve this material. Yeah, yes. Yes. And that's a twenty-three thousand dollars. That's correct. Okay. okay. And it is three thousand dollars more expensive because it's a better material. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. More questions? We have a motion and a second. Maybe please have a vote. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Vice President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Kaiser, for the report that you were just dying to give earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, we bring before you tonight the setting of the salary for the new classification of systems analyst for our technology department. The Board of Education is requested to set salary for the new classified management classification of systems analyst at range 25 on the classified management salary schedule. This would be um, equivalent to step one being $6,473 a month and step six being eight thousand three hundred and four dollars a month. And right now this is neutral because it's not creating a new spot that we're doing. It's the next spot that we have that will be adding more burden to our already unfunded liabilities. Correct. This position is um, a partial replacement of a position that was vacated months ago. Okay. Any questions of Dr. Kaiser? Entertain a motion. So moved. I'll second. Motion and a second. Discussion. May we please have a vote. I would, oh, sorry. I would like to ask a question. I would like to make a request, um, uh, much akin to what you were talking about, um, acronyms and stuff like that. Can we have things expanded? Um, I don't know what range 25 means. Can, in instances such as this, can that be expanded to an actual number so I can see this is what we're going to, or this is what we're suggesting we're going to pay this person. This is what their salary is. Yes, the um, the range here is, let's see, I just had it. Um, Go ahead. The so, range here is $6,473. That would be step one. And the range goes up to step six in increments. The sixth step would be $8,304 a month. And these ranges are set by the personnel commission based on the job alikes and a formula that they create and abide by. I, I think Ms. Lockerby brings up a, a good question and one that each of us, when we first come on, before we figure out what the alphabet soup is, um, if we could get a, maybe just get a little cheat sheet that um, and laminate it so that folks can <laughs> take it and carry it. That's it'd be very helpful. <laughs> and I, I know this was something that came up. I think that uh, Dr. Tarosian has been doing is at, when the acronym is one that's used all the time, the first time that it appears on the paper, it will have its long version to it. And then um, from then on in the report, you'll see the, um, the acronym to it, so it's there. Um, okay, so we have a motion and a second. We had discussion. Is any, any other questions? Maybe please have the vote. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? 
Yes. Or Vice President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 4-0. Um, up next is uh, pending board issues and Dr. Tarosian. We have no new items on, on the pending board issues and have been following it along. Thank you. Um, old business, we have our next regularly scheduled board meeting will be on Wednesday, February the 13th here in this chamber at 7 p.m. And on Wednesday, February the 27th, uh, anybody who's listening and doesn't know that our Wednesday the 13th will be the day before Valentine's Day. So all people like me don't forget. Um, and then uh, on new business, uh, we have a pupil free day and all sites will be closed on Monday, January the 28th. The State of the City will be held on Monday, January the 28th. Uh, Lincoln's birthday, all sites are closed on Monday, February the 11th. And President's Day, all sites will be closed on Monday, February the 18th. And if there's no further business before this body, we will stand adjourned at 8.59. <laughs> you know, I, I just had to quit going from the bottom to the top, you know. Like, where's it going? Like, Zoom! <laughs> That little white, that wrapped that stuff. That's boring. Yeah. It's boring. Let's get to the meat. Let's go to the good stuff. I thought that was great discussion on that. I love that.